Ladies and gentlemen, Wrestling with Rosenberg, and uh, what a special, special day to be talking to one of the best guys in the business and smartest, best, toughest, you, the hardcore legend, Mick Foley. Uh, most polite as well. So. Oh, definitely the most polite. Yeah. Um, how are you, man? How you feeling? I'm I'm feeling pretty good, uh, but just before we got on, we were talking about uh, what's known as a Legends deal. Yes, the, I, I asked if you'd signed the Legends yeah. contract recently. And I asked WWE if I could sign that, and they said that uh, in order to sign a Legends deal, I had to actually be a legend oh. first. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it said in my own mind does not count. Uh, well, how, how do you feel when you look back realistically... You know, you're you're not the most traditional of guys. True. Like from uh, you know, you're for an all time great, you're not a traditional wrestler. You wouldn't be up there in the in the grapplers or any list like that. Right. But how do as a as a wrestling fan and someone who loved it so much and was, uh, you know, I'm at the garden seeing all these classic shows. Where do you put yourself as a as a great wrestler? <laughs> it's not up to me to put myself anywhere. I'll I'll just say. When I watched uh, the WWE uh, DVD of the 50 greatest superstars, uh, uh, Kurt Angle is a guy that I really like, I respect, and Kurt and I came in with in one place of each other. I was thrilled to be on the list at all. <laughs> Kurt was offended. <laughs> if anyone wants to throw me on a list of 50 greatest or 100 greatest, I'm really flattered. Uh, I think... You know, if I wasn't on there, maybe I'd be hurt. As long as I'm on there, I'm fine. But I don't make, I don't pretend that I deserve to be in the top ten or anything like that. Uh, who, who do you, who, who are your, your favorites? Your, who do you think consider to be? Is there any one name that you consider the greatest? The greatest ever? Yeah. Um, of all time. Uh, of Ter all time. Terry Funk was my favorite, and in my mind, uh, the greatest wrestler. And so other people will mention d different names, uh, but Terry made it really easy to suspend disbelief. You know, I know I, I pitched an idea to WWE one time, and I, I said this hinges upon the idea, you know, that Terry, that t you guys believe that Terry Funk can come across like a certifiable madman in a couple of weeks. And Dusty Rhodes said. That'd be easy because Terry Funk is a certifiable madman. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, even even as recently as like the Chainsaw Charlie stuff, and all, he he really did pull off somehow. Considering we all know, if you know wrestling, you know. Wait, wait don't, we don't know. But go ahead, go ahead. Seems man. like the nicest guy ever, right? Terry's a great guy, but man, you talk about turning on a switch. I've been at shows where he's come in and he just works himself into a frenzy. And I said to uh, uh, one of the valets, I said, he might be kidding, but I don't know. You'd better leave the ring. You'd really better leave the ring. And as much as he likes me, and I mean, I, I think Terry almost looks at me like I'm a son. Like, he's able to channel, and this is what a lot of the great ones do, and Terry calls it borderlining, where you use uh, an emotion that's very real to bring out an interview that you know might be based somewhat in fiction, and it's part of sports entertainment. But the emotions are very real, and like I said, it becomes uh, uh, pretty easy for people to su suspend disbelief. But since I'm with WWE now, that's enough talk about Terry Funk, don't you think? Uh, <laughs> I, the, to me, the greatest superstar of this generation, and I consider this generation to be the monthly pay-per-view generation. Greatest superstar of this generation to me is Shawn Michaels, as far as a guy who gave you a great match almost every single time. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know if he's capable of having a bad match. If he is, I didn't see one. No, he he brings the best out of everyone. He he he's Sean is incredibly special, and I grew up as a you know Bret Hart number one guy, and I still am. I love absolutely love Bret, and um, we got to talk to Sean on this show recently, and 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 I, which was I was proud to tell him that I'm a Bret Hart fan who really came to love and admire yeah. his work for how much he could work with everyone, and really you got the sense he could still do it. He didn't retire with his game slipping. No, no, he retired at the at the top of his game. In, and I think it was really important for Sean to have that kind of comeback, not only as a wrestler but as a human being as well. I don't think he liked the idea that people would say, oh, that Sean Michael was a great performer, but he was a, a pain in the neck. I mean, I think even in my last book I referred to the bad Sean, good Sean eras uh, where he could stir up some trouble. And um, he, as far as I know, I mean, there, he was uh, no problem. He was a great wrestler. He came back. If anything, he took his physical limitations that come with age and was able to parlay them into strengths. You know, uh, 
Uh, one of the most profound lines in any movie that affected my life was Clint Eastwood saying, a man's got to know his limitations. Once you know your limitations, you know, you can really do some good work within them. Uh, do you remember the first time you met Owen Hart? I do. I do. It was on a, a Joel Goodhart tri-state wrestling show, and Owen and I uh, hit it off immediately. That was also the same night I met Luna Vachon. Uh, and I just saw Brett. Um, we were on a show together in Connecticut where we did a Q&A, and a question came up about Owen. And uh, Brett was talking about how much you know Owen liked me and how much uh, you know he sensed a kindred spirit because we both loved to hang on to the money we made you know that like, you uh, guys are probably the two <laughs> most notorious cheapskates in the business two of the I, smart guys who hold that I, money hey look that doesn't mean i'm not a 25 percent tipper okay uh, big uh, difference I, between I, that difference. And... but if I, I i don't see any reason like my my kids will beg me not to take them anywhere in my uh, beaten up red minivan and they're like why don't you get rid of it i was like because it works and there's a life's lesson. It's like it's a metaphor for a, a larger, you know, a larger statement on life. If something works, you don't get rid of it. You don't discard it. You get to appreciate bad, broken down things, whereas new things only get a little less nice. Did you and did you and Owen bond on the road to an extent in terms of the lifestyle that you that you chose to live? Yeah. It, what was funny is that Owen and I were, we didn't travel all the time together, but if we had a deal that we knew of, we knew that we would share it with each other because we wouldn't ruin it. Uh, if you have a good deal, the best way to ruin it is to tell the other guys about it. So Owen and I would share, like, all right, we got this hotel, 26 bucks, not bad. Beds are, you know, semi-decent, respectable neighborhood. And, uh, and we uh, took a lot of pride in uh, the fact that we could stretch, you know, uh, a dollar quite a way. Uh, at a certain point, Abe Lincoln began screaming because I was pinching him too hard. <laughs> um what uh? What hurts on what hurts on your body day to day? You've you've gone you've gone through a lot. When you're watching you towards the end of your really active career, you know you got the sense that you could see things that were a little harder for you to do. Yeah. What what hurts day to day when you move around? Oh man, if you see me go down a flight of stairs, it's not it's not pretty. The knees are really bad. Knees are bad. Uh, when people uh, come to my house, they're surprised that there's not a lot of, there's really no wrestling things uh, like hanging on the walls. I mean, maybe there's a little something in one of the rooms. They go, D you know, don't you need something, or, you know, like uh, reminders, or, you know, memories? I was like, yeah, I have something that reminds me. It's called getting up in the morning. Like every morning I remember that I was, you know, did this stuff for a long time and I, I, I worked hard. I was under no illusion that there wasn't going to be a price to pay. For the stuff I was doing, uh, does it make it hard? Um, like your weight, can, your weight can kind of go up and down. Yeah. Does it make it hard in terms of staying in shape uh, that you're in such pain? You know, to do probably do a lot of exercise. You know what? I mean, that's not an excuse not to exercise because there are low impact exercises I can do that I don't, and it would certainly make life a lot easier on me if I dropped quite a, quite a bit of weight. And I am working on it. But um, as far as my days of you know, hitting the iron those days, you know, I can't do that. That just results in further injury. But I should be on the bike and the elliptical, and I should be working a little harder at it than I did. <laughs> um, beyond the mat, the, 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 arguably, I think what people thought at the time was the most striking part of that movie was the stuff with your family yeah. um, in your match versus The Rock. Yeah. Um, was that a work? I don't really understand. I couldn't. I, I I've tried to figure it out now as a as a smart, as a smart mark later in life. I tried to go back and rewatch and be like, well, hold on. Was were they working the documentary or was that was was your family really that freaked out? What was the deal with yeah, Beyond the Mat? There's no way that you could you know, f you know, tell a, a four and a six year old. I didn't. I I honestly thought they would not. Uh, they they wouldn't think their dad could be hurt because I always told them. Dad, you know, no, Dad's just playing. And if you see the thing, I'm actually telling uh, my kids. I'm introducing them to The Rock. Mm -hmm. You and see I'm it. Saying, hey, you know, here's, you know, the, the Dad and Rock. I can't remember what I said. And it was, a, you know, it was not a great parental moment <laughs> to have on camera. But what was really telling about the film, I remember at one time that Al Snow and I were at the debut of uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger's movie, End of Days. And there was a group of about 20 women that were kind of looking at me, which is not unusual. You know, for, uh, but, uh, I, well, the group that was outside here when you showed up. <laughs> but they came walking over after talking among themselves, and what they wanted to say was they were part of a universal focus group, and they were not wrestling fans, but they really thought I was a good dad. 
a, a few other a few people will see it and say, "What a terrible dad! He put his kids in that position." But I didn't know they were going to react react that way. The match got ca- got carried away. Um, it, it was you know, I mean, it made for powerful power powerful TV, but it was not you know, it was not a work. But here's the thing about kids: they're resilient. Uh, to quote John Candy in Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. Uh, they came around after four or five weeks. They started talking again. You know, kids, <laughs> kids bounce back. And now, you know, it's funny. I'm going to be on uh, Celebrity Wife Swap. I believe the January 24th uh, edition. Your wife's hot, man. What are you doing? This- uh, yeah, and, and she ended up with a real, uh, real clunker. This Antonio Sabato Jr. What a dog. <laughs> you know who he is, right? Yeah. He's like one of the best looking guys ever <laughs> in the history of the world. Um. But it'll be the first time that most people have seen my kids since that movie. How old is How old is they're, Dewey? Uh, how old is... They're twenty and eighteen now. Oh my God, that makes all of us feel a old. Little girl who was uh, who was in tears is now eighteen and six feet tall. Oh yeah. my Lord! And I'm gonna tell you that you know what people may say anything about your parenting. That's not the most embarrassing parenting moment of the movie. The most embarrassing parenting moment uh, moment of the movie is your wife's USA windbreaker outfit. <laughs> I've never heard anybody say that. <laughs> I, I love thought, that movie. I know it very well. Whenever it shows that part, I'm like, why is she wearing that I USA thought it was outfit? pretty hot, man. Well, she's a hot chick. I'm not, I think I, we had a gy- we had a gym at the time, and it was like one of those things you could order. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you guys did seem to always have. I don't know. There's something. Uh, it's a. It's, we don't know much. Besides that movie and, and your books, you obviously we do know your family pretty well, actually. And it is one of the family relationships that's very nice in the wrestling business to see that seems very authentic and not uh, messed up at all and tainted by the crazy world of wrestling, which can happen. years. It's an indoor uh, wrestling record. Most guys are on there. Wrestling is very – uh, this business can be really difficult on, on families. Uh, so it takes a special type of woman, you know, just to tolerate the, the husband being gone. And let's face it, I'm the type of guy who gets women literally throwing themselves. I'm like the Wayne Newton of I, sports well, entertainment. I, listen, I know. I mean, Adam Hopkins is here. He's seen me actually, you know, get hurt, buried underneath piles a of pile panties of- that were thrown <laughs> at me. It's like I'm actually like struggling for air. It's like, girl, lady, take it easy. There's only so well, many. Well, yeah, but whatever. You could make jokes, but the fact <laughs> is, I know there's still times when beautiful women are, pr- are probably infatuated by Mick Foley. It has to happen. Very seldom. But here's the thing. When somebody is infatuated with me, they're usually unique. <laughs> Very special. I draw th- you know what? I, here's This is the truth, and you can Google this, all right? I'm the only person in the world who can be Googled under the words Hell in a Cell, Hardcore Legend, and Feminist. If you Google those, that's my what name makes, comes up. That's what makes this man so special, <laughs> is that the fact that you can do that. Um, there's been uh, chit-chat about a last match for you, there's been chit chat about Stone Cold Steve Austin coming back to get a last match. First, let me start with you. Is 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 are you done, or could there be what? Do you think you could still work a match that would be up to your standard of a of a real classic match? Just what I think. I'm out. They drag me <laughs> back. Honestly, I don't know. And the truth is, if like if Stone Cold were to come back uh, for WrestleMania, I think he should. You think I mean, it should be this year? Do you think it should be him versus Punk this year? I th- yeah, I think it'd be great. I think those two, you know, they really respect each other. Uh, Steve, uh, I, I Steve's in phenomenal shape. I think they could have a very good match. Um, and if that's the case, if the, he's the comeback story of the year, then there's no sense of me getting involved. There's this part of me, though, that still thinks that I could do something with one of the younger guys. And we're really fortunate at WWE to have, like, Five or six guys, and I'm specifically talking about bad guys here. Um, I mean, like your other guys, Sheamus and Punk and guys like that on the good side. Um, and I'm not talking about them, but guys like uh, The Miz. Ziggler. Ziggler is really like he's such guy. a pleasure to watch on a weekly basis. Like, I don't think most of our universe gets how good that guy is yet. Like, I think they're getting it. He's special. And then when that big moment comes, everyone's going to accept it because he's laid down the groundwork. He's got all the credibility. from And you know, and you know who's gotten super special recently? Cody Rhodes. Cody is Rhodes has really, yeah, he's really found that confidence. And it's really, it's a, it's really exciting when you see people hitting their stride. And for him, Booker's that guy. So Booker T is that guy that he's gonna. That's gonna be the one that gets him, you know, to that next level. And and Miz, you know, Miz main evented WrestleMania. He's already there. But the selfish side of me is like, you know, all right, let's not think about what I can do for him. 
let's think about what he could do for me because he's such a great jerk. I yeah. mean, he's a great jerk. Uh, and so I could do some things there. Uh, Wade Barrett's another one. So there's about, you know, there's four or five guys that I think um, if I were to get in some semblance of shape um, that I could uh, probably do something with. But, again, that, a lot of that depends on what kind of condition I could get in. If, if, Stone Cold, if this year Stone Cold Steve Austin came back and you had Rock Cena, Punk Austin, is that the biggest WrestleMania of all time? Uh, sounds like it would be up there. Uh, I mean, I love this idea. When people were said, what? They're announcing this a year ahead of time? Like, that's insane, talking about Cena Rock. And I'm like, you know what? On uh, December 25th, after the presents are unwrapped, I'm already thinking about next Christmas. And I like the fact that I know it's there. I it's know I know what around. you mean. There is a happy feeling about yeah, it throughout the year. So this is groundbreaking. You know, you never know unless you try. And people can say what they want about Mr. McMahon, and I have. Mm-hmm. Said what I many things. You've said many things, <laughs> but he's not afraid to gamble, and uh, he's not afraid to lose. And like he said, uh, you know, he picks himself up, he dusts himself off, and he goes on to the next, the next great um, a- adventure. But I think this is going to be a gamble that pays off, and that was, I think, seen when they sold, you know, more tickets in the first day than any WrestleMania, uh, any wrestling event. Sports entertainment event. Am I allowed to? Yeah, wrestling. What are you saying? What are you doing saying wrestling? <laughs> um, I'll tell you the guy who I think is currently the most special in the business. Right now, the run he's on is th- the best thing going in the business today, and that is Mark Henry. I think Mark Henry. What do you think about what Mark Henry's doing? Who would have thought in 1996 that this guy would be hitting his stride in 2011? <laughs> yeah. I mean, he really, you know, he's found that confidence. Uh, I loved him as sexual chocolate, you know, I mean, but this, that, that was, that was the broccoli on the side of the main dish. Mm-hmm. Mark Henry is now, he's now the entree. And I don't, I don't pick him as one of, when I talk about the four or five guys, because Mark's already there. And a matchup wise, I don't see the intrigue, me and Mark Henry, as I do with some of these younger guys, but it's great. He's found it. He's having really good matches. He believes in himself. He goes out there. I mean, he's uh, he's credible. He's uh, you know by some standards, he really is the world's strongest man. If you combine his powerlifting and uh, Olympic lifting totals, no one else even comes close. Yeah, he's yeah. unbelievable. And you know, I I spoke to him recently, and he said, I, I said, I was like, how are you doing? This is so cool. This runs amazing. He said, it is tiring. In a different way, he was back in New York. Uh, yeah, for a lot of people, he lives in Harlem. He's around here quite a bit. And he said, "I come home and can't wake up. You know, the whole time I'm home, I sleep. It's like incredibly draining to be this entrenched in in a in a character. You know, it is so." And he said, "It's a lot different than when you know before you're working matches and you're working hard. But when you're num- when you know you're number one yeah, and you're yeah, yeah. and you're gunning for it." It's different. Did it did it feel that way for you also? Like when the mankind character, for example, is going, or you were really at the height of one character. Does it take something different out of you mentally? I was never actually number one. <laughs> well, it was a tough time. It was a tough time. <laughs> you know what? Uh, I never had the championship long enough to uh, to where I felt like I was, you know, carrying that load of the company. As Edge pointed out, I was a transitional champion. <laughs> But I like to think I was the greatest transitional champion of all time. I was a three-time transitional, transitional champion. champion. Yeah, I remember uh, uh, Jericho won the uh, WWE or World Championship, uh, and and he la- was later overturned. Like he had it for an hour, and I was like, yes, at least somebody held it for less time than I did. My my last run was for a day, uh, it was like for twenty-two hours, and then I lost. What was it. your longest run? It was only about six weeks. Six you know, weeks. And then uh, that was uh, when The Rock and I were going back and forth. But now the nice thing is, uh, you know, he's, you know, he's su- such a superhero. And I have DVDs where I am laying the smacketh down on his candy. Yeah, you know what? So. Hey, you know what? All they say now is hardcore legend and multi time WWE champion. That's all they say about you. So it doesn't really matter. And personal friend of Tori Amos. Ladies and gentlemen, he's the hardcore legend Mick Foley. I have a hunch we'll be doing this again, so I wanted to leave some topics out there for us to cover next time. But thank you so much, man. Thanks. Really enjoyed it. Appreciate the time. One of the best. Thank you.